This program is made possible by the members and donors to the show. To support the work we do for as little as a buck a month, or to sign up as a member and get commercial-free versions of every episode, plus members-only bonus content, sign up at patreon.com slash bestofleft, or visit the Contribute tab at bestofleft.com. Now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of Left podcast, in which we shall learn about some of the historical context for the dynamics of international trade, some progressive ideas about managing the domestic results of trade, trade, the economics and policies of tariffs, and the dangers of trade wars. Clips today come from Economic Update with Professor Richard Wolff, Left Out, The Inquiry, The Ezra Klein Show, The Tom Hartman Program, and This Is Hell. First, so we're all on the same page, what is a tariff? It's just a name for a particular kind of tax. A tariff is a tax you put on something when it comes into your country from somewhere else. The mere fact that it was produced elsewhere incurs a tax which we, the United States, put on those commodities that come into the country from outside to make them more expensive for Americans who have to pay the price of the good plus the tax on top of it. That's all. Why are tariffs levied? Answer. Industries, all kinds, agricultural, manufacturing, you name it try to get help from the government when they're in trouble with competitors from abroad. When competitors in other countries can produce goods more cheaply, or at least sell them more cheaply here in the United States, it hurts American producers, people producing here. And one of the things those producers could do, of course, is become more efficient. They could automate. They could work harder. They could find cheaper materials. And often they try those things. But one of the things they've always tried has been to manipulate and maneuver the government to give them protection. That's why tariffs are called a kind of protection. Because if you put a tariff on the goods coming in, they become more expensive, and that allows producers inside the country to sell their goods when they couldn't before, because their goods are not subject to that tax. Please keep this in mind the next time you hear the executives or the politicians paid by the executives of the companies that get these favors from the United States government. They will tell you how the government is inefficient and we need to get the government off our backs and the private sector is efficient. And Yeah, it's all very nice talk, but they're spending big bucks getting the government to give them protection. Who has protection in the United States now? Virtually every sector somehow. I'm going to give you a few examples. We protect trucks, light trucks, 25%. That's right. The tariff in the United States makes it virtually impossible for foreign truck producers to produce those trucks and send them here. It also makes the trucks more expensive to Americans. Why? Because the domestic producer has the benefit of not having to pay a tax and can raise his price to up close to what the foreigner has to suffer with because the foreigner has to pay the tax. In other words, tariffs are a way of trying to solve your own economic problems at the expense of people abroad. And the problem is every country does this. Every country mixes a variety of protections. Let me give you a second example which was in the news. Dairy in the United States. Cost of a gallon of milk in the United States is much cheaper than the cost of a gallon of milk in Canada. Canada has tariffs to protect their dairy to be able to charge the much higher prices so they don't have to compete with American goods. Is that because Americans are more efficient in their dairy production? Not at all. What Americans have is another form of protection, American farmers. They get subsidized by the government. Because another thing that corporations like to do is get the government to give them subsidies. That's how we handle corn farming in the United States. That's how we handle wheat farming in the United States. And corn and wheat is what we give to the cows that make the milk. So the milk is subsidized in the United States, which is why it's cheap and too much of it is produced. And that's not because the Canadians have done anything. That's because we have protected our industries. Over the years, different capitalist countries bargain with each other to try to keep that kind of crazy system under control. 
every government tries to protect its enterprises with tariffs and subsidies and quotas and a whole lot of other things I don't have the time to go into. But there's nothing new here. Mr. Trump's notion is protecting America. America has been protecting itself just ducky fine for a long time. It uses the same things other countries do. What the United States wants to do now is renegotiate the game to disadvantage everybody else and advantage the United States. You find it Amazing that the other countries are upset and are retaliating. What in the world would you propose them to do? And if we all play this nasty game, we will dissolve the international economy. And believe me, the risks and dangers of that far exceed anything having to do with this. But does Mr. Trump care? Not a bit. He is pandering to the America first mentality bashing the immigrants, now bashing our trading partners, looking like Mr. Tough Guy while he helps the industries that he's protecting and the rest let the chips fall where they may. He hopes this will help him politically. exactly is going on here from your perspective and can you give us an idea of what exactly is an unfair competition from both your vantage point and the vantage point of China's competitors who are arguing this? You've asked two questions and I'll answer them in order. I think that uh, Trump is somewhat out of his league in trying a good cop, bad cop bluff by putting a lot of nationalists around him is if uh, he thinks they can uh, make a threat that is going to force China to uh, give up its uh, uh, its economic plan. I think all, all Trump really originally wanted was a symbolic public relations uh, win to defend the strategy of uh, the art of breaking the deal. He thought, well, I'll get China to give me something, uh, and it can only be something symbolic so that he could uh, claim that he had a public relations win. But by making this threat on Twitter and television without any attempt to actually meet with the Chinese trade officials, he led China and other countries to take his uh, gang of nationalists seriously uh, and prepare a defense plan of their own. And uh, what they've tried to do is say, look, don't even try to go along this uh, route. Uh, you don't know. Uh, you're talking about trade and at issue is the whole uh, balance of payments. And uh, what America is trying to do is push a dual standard uh, on the world, uh, just again as it did repeatedly in the 60s and 70s. Free trade for other countries, protectionism is for the United States alone. And so uh, your second question is, what is unfair competition? Well, from the point of view of a free market neoliberal, it's a mixed economy. It's uh, unfair if other countries will have public infrastructure investment, which is just exactly how the United States, Germany, and every other leading industrial nation built up its economic power in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. What China's doing is what U.S. economic planning did in the late 19th and early 20th century. Its government is investing in roads, education, basic infrastructure to provide key services at subsidized prices or freely. The whole objective is to minimize the cost of living and hence the basic wage levels uh, and other costs of doing business. Uh, you know how America was able to outcompete uh, with uh, England and other countries by having subsidized education. Uh, we built roads. We built huge infrastructure. And the Internet was basically developed by government and turned over to the private sector. America's pharmaceutical uh, patents basically were developed by uh, government uh, laboratories and turned over to the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but when China provides uh, uh, public support uh, for its economy, uh, America says, well, it's unfair. You have to privatize uh, and uh, everything, and you have to uh, tie your hands behind your back by uh, turning your economy into a kind of Thatcherite. Uh, economy. You have to let uh, financial people add on uh, – you have to operate 
all of your basic public services for profit. Uh, and by profit, that means you cover your cost of production, you uh, financialize it by the cost of uh, credit and borrowing, sort of like the British water authorities do, uh, with, with huge uh, costs, uh, and make yourself such a high-cost economy that we in America who subsidize our economy can undersell you and make you dependent on us. That's basically uh, what he's saying to them, and uh, they're, uh, as you can imagine, they're just laughing. Yeah, and and Michael, what exactly is unfair trade? I mean, we just got into what unfair competition is, but but what is unfair trade? The way Trump talks is unfair trade is running a trade surplus with the United States. Now, remember, the United States already, uh, uh, it, because it's a heavy foreign investor, there's a huge remission of profits to the United States on capital account. There's a huge remission of debt service from other countries to the United States uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, financial account. So uh, the United States uh, tr- runs a trade deficit that puts, uh, uh, provides other countries with the money to pay their debt to the United States. Now, let's assume for a minute that the United States had a trade balance with every country, which is what uh, Trump uh, said bilaterally he wants to achieve. If if the trade is in balance and America has a huge uh, balance of payment surplus in debt service from all the money that countries owe in dollars, a huge uh, uh, remission of profits, by American companies that have bought out foreign industry, the American dollar would soar, it would double, triple in value, and as the dollar went up in price, that means that other countries, third world countries, uh, uh, Asian countries, whose international debts are denominated in dollars, would have to pay much, much more of their, uh, many of their exports, much more of their labor to buy the high priced dollars to pay uh, the, the debts that they owe the United States and to remit uh, the profits. So uh, what uh, Trump is asking for is mathematically impossible without such a crisis that it would price almost all American industry and agriculture out of world markets. It would force other countries uh, to be uh, independent in their food supply uh, and just about everything else. Uh, it would be exactly the same balance of payments uh, tangle that occurred in the 1920s uh, that broke down as a result of uh, uh, the inter-allied debts and the German reparations. And in the 1920s, uh, my book on trade development as foreign uh, development is all about basically that debate. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said, look, if you're going to insist in debts being repaid uh, to the, uh, the United States uh, by the Allies for World War One, you have to provide them with the money to pay. And that means you have to open your markets by, and by importing. You'll pay them dollars for the imports, and they get the dollars to pay you. There's a circular flow. Trump has no idea of the circular flow. He confuses the balance of uh, payments with the balance of trade and uh, and then says that it's unfair for other countries not to drive the world economy bankrupt. Uh, he doesn't spell it out that that's the result, but what he thinks is unfair is so narrow-minded, such a tunnel vision that uh, other countries uh, and American economists themselves are looking at him and think, my God, the guy has not a, a basic course in uh, international trade and balance of payments theory. He, uh, he, it, he's uh, making it up in his mind and is just uh, doesn't have a clue is the trade and payments are different things. Michael, you know, the lay person who who doesn't really have the time to dive deeply into what all this means, they sort of see these headlines flash across their TV screens, they pick up their daily papers or scroll through their social media accounts, and, and they see these two superpowers exchanging language like war, battle, standoff when it comes to this trade situation. To the average person, that might appear kind of frightening. I can imagine anyone seeing these two powers go at it with each other with this type of language. I'm sure it's concerning to some degree. So what are we looking at? Uh, What can China do? Are we looking at an actual trade war like some press and and pundits are suggesting? Uh, What can China do and and what do you think is going to happen here? First of all, uh, it's not two powers going against each other. It's one power, the United States, 
going against China. What Trump says is America is becoming dependent uh, on on China, and it's threatening the American way of life. And he's defined uh, the uh, threat to American dominance. By dominance, he uh, what Trump means is making other countries dependent on the United States. It means other countries letting the Americans monopolize all of the uh, uh, high productivity, high technology, economic uh, rent yielding uh, industries so that we can get all the profits and they will essentially produce the raw materials for us and be customers, but we will be in control so that if we don't like China, we can do what we did in the 1950s and 60s and uh, all of a sudden stop exporting to them and saying, we'll starve you if you don't follow the policies we want. That's what it did uh, in the uh, 60s when uh, Canada uh, broke the U.S. Uh, sanctions and uh, uh, exported the wheat to China to save it. Uh, the, this idea that uh, other countries are threatening our ability to strangle them is so perverse and so basically asymmetric and evil that it's jaw-dropping. Now for the Midterms Minute, a look at the candidates and races you need to know about, shout about, and support to make sure we have a blue tsunami on November 6th. We want to remind you that primaries in Arizona and Florida are right around the corner on August 28th. If you missed our spotlights on those dates, head to bestoftheleft.com slash activism for details. You can make a difference in all remaining primaries by getting involved no matter what state you live in. Both Justice Democrats and a brand new Congress offer get-out-the-vote-online calling and texting tools with scripts on individual candidates, allowing you to talk to voters from the comfort of home. This is a great way to make a real impact. We've included the links to both tools in the show notes. Today, we're going to talk about Massachusetts, which holds its primary on September 4th, and Delaware, which holds its primary two days later on September 6th. We'll start with Massachusetts. There's an extremely crowded field of Democrats in Massachusetts' 3rd District, where Justice Democrat and Latino Victory candidate Juana Matias is running for Congress. With the incumbent retiring, this is the first contested Democratic primary for the seat since 1994. Matias is currently a state representative and is running a grassroots campaign against establishment candidates with big money behind them. In Massachusetts' 7th district, Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley is a Justice Democrat making waves. She's primarying incumbent Michael Capuano, who, to be fair, is a lifelong champion of progressive policies before they were mainstream and has held this House seat since 1998. Though both embrace progressive ideals, the two differ greatly on approach and identifying root causes. A video of Presley, who is black, in which she shares her thoughts on identity politics and representation during a recent debate, has gone viral. According to the Boston Globe, the 7th District is one of the most diverse and economically unequal in the state. When it comes to governor, Massachusetts is one of those deep blue states that more often than not votes in a moderate Republican. Mitt Romney wasn't the only one. Current Governor Charlie Baker is another moderate Republican up for re-election this year, and he's popular because he doesn't often rock the boat with Democrats. But although he says he accepts climate science, he's a big proponent of new fossil fuel infrastructure. The people of Massachusetts have better options this year. One of them is Democrat Bob Massey, a lifelong national health care system advocate and climate activist who founded both the New Economy Coalition and the Sustainable Solutions Lab at UMass Boston. He recently received the endorsement of Our Revolution and Massachusetts Peace Action. To participate in the Massachusetts primary on September 6th, you must have been registered to vote by August 15th. Absentee ballot requests must be received by August 31st, and ballots must be received by September 4th. If you aren't registered yet, make sure you are registered by October 17th to participate in the general. Now we turn to Delaware. The Senate race in Delaware is a stark example of establishment versus bold new progressive blood. Friend of big banks and incumbent Senator Tom Carper has held political office of some kind in Delaware since 1976, and he's gotten endorsement from Joe Biden. 
His primary opponent is Kerry Evelyn Harris, a Justice Democrat and veteran with backing from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Harris is running a low-budget campaign funded by the people and is working hard to expose the myth that making corporations happy is good for the people. If she wins in November, she would be the first woman, first African-American, and first openly LGBT candidate to be a U.S. Senator for Delaware. To participate in the Delaware primary on September 4th, you must have been registered to vote by August 11th. Absentee ballots must be requested by September 5th at noon, and ballots must be received by September 6th at 8 p.m. If you aren't registered, make sure you register by October 13th to vote in the general. We want to emphasize registration cutoff dates and absentee ballot requests and submission dates are different for each state, sometimes even each county. We highly suggest reviewing your state's information and voter ID laws at rockthevote.org as soon as possible to ensure you will be able to vote in both the primary and general elections. And we know you heard a lot of names and dates today, but we hope you'll take a moment to check the segment notes, which include all of the links to this information as well as additional resources. And today's Midterms Minute, just like every activism segment we produce, is archived and organized under the Activism tab at bestoftheleft.com. So if building the bluest of blue waves is important to you, be sure to hit the share buttons to spread the word about supporting progressive candidates across the country via social media so that others in your network can spread the word too. China does not want a trade war because the old system worked incredibly well for China. Stephen Tsang is director of the China Institute at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He's watched China's transformation with awe. In the previous 30 years or so, they have raised something like 800 million people out of poverty. Wow, that is a huge achievement. It's a huge achievement by any standard. It's an achievement that's created high expectations. The Communist Party needs to show that things will keep getting better or they risk revolt. The Communist Party will continue to have a monopoly of power in China in return for delivering a better tomorrow. So they need to deliver a strong economy in order to maintain their strong legitimacy. So where does the Communist Party want to take the Chinese economy next? Well, what the Chinese Communist Party would like to do under Xi Jinping is to make China great again, make China the most vibrant, uh, innovative, strong economy in the world. To do that, the government has a plan. It's called Made in China 2025. Now, Made in China 2025 is the flagship economic policy of President Xi Jinping, which is to move the Chinese industrial base up into high-tech manufacturing and goods. And the Trump administration wants to restrict the development of Made in China 2025. So America is really trying to scupper the 2025 policy by targeting goods that are part of that strategy. Yes. That may sound like playing dirty, but as we've heard, America accuses China of stealing intellectual property. The Chinese, though, see it differently. The Chinese have always not fully subscribed to copyrights, intellectual property rights. Even government agencies use pirated copies of computer programs. And the justification have always been that if those programs were affordable in China, we would all happily pay for them. But all these very rich multinationals are charging exorbitant prices that poor countries cannot afford. And therefore, we are doing it to maintain the standard of living and rights of people in this country. So they justify it as an ethical way around exorbitant Western prices. They do. And they also remind the rest of the world that the United States did exactly the same to the intellectual property rights of European countries back in the 19th and early 20th century. 
the U.S. only became a champion of intellectual property rights after the U.S. became a champion in intellectual property. The way China sees it, President Xi has to be ruthless so he can keep growing the economy, lifting more people out of poverty, and creating a bigger middle class. But there's something else at stake for President Xi that makes it every bit as hard for him to back down as it is for President Trump, and that's national pride. Absolutely, for President Xi Jinping, he is projecting himself as a kind of strongman of China. For China, and therefore he cannot afford to be seen to back down under American pressure. But then you also have an American president who seems to feel that he must have the final say on whatever it happens to be. So you are in a situation where the two leaders will be playing chicken, and whether one will back off or not, we don't know. So the stage is set. The two presidents are toe to toe. And neither looks ready to back down. China is saying, "We are the second largest economy in the world, and we have the right not just to follow the rules of the international trade system. We have the right to set some of these rules now." That's a much bigger compromise than any tweaking of tariffs, and one with consequences not just for America but for the entire free market system. It would mean accepting that far from China adapting to Western trading norms, the WTO is going to have to adapt to China's way of doing things. Some of the rules that we might have to accept are that China isn't a market economy, and we need to、um, be okay with that in the World Trade Organization. So we just have to give up on the idea that that China is going to liberalise and and just let them continue to play by their own rules. China is not going to be what we consider a market economy. They are going to allow their state, the government, to have a much larger role in the economy than having it driven by market forces. The way that we have set up the system and the WTO was set up. We have to change our expectation of China becoming a market economy like we have established in other parts of the world. That would be a massive concession to China. It would signal the defeat of attempts to convert the communist nation into a free market economy, and it could mean the rewriting of global trade rules, even the beginning of a new phase of globalization. Today's episode is sponsored by Bolt, the security as a service company that is your one-stop shop for online security. Now, to be secure with your data, you need a few things. So, here's a quick overview: you need a secure, encrypted connection between your devices and the rest of the internet. You need a secure and encrypted place to store files and back up your full hard drive online, and you need a way to create and store long, complicated, and unique passwords for every online account you own. With Bolt, they provide all of these services as a package deal, which allows them to offer it to their customers for seventy-five percent off. And as a special offer to my listeners, you can get an additional ten percent off when you use the coupon code Best at checkout. So with Bolt, you get the Their fully encrypted virtual private network, or VPN, which acts as a middleman between you and the rest of the net, keeping your data private. Add to that their unlimited online storage and backup solutions, and their password manager. And in one fell swoop, you'll have all of the tools you need to keep yourself as secure as possible online. I've made it easy for you to find this deal. Just go to bestofleft.com/bolt. That's bolt like deadbolt. And don't forget to enter the coupon code best for. For an additional ten percent off your bill, and not just for the first month, but for forever. Again, that's bestoftheleft.com/bolt, and use the coupon code BEST at checkout. Let's take NAFTA because I think NAFTA is, is one of the big agreements that most of the audience is familiar with. How did the integration of the economies of Canada, the U.S., and Mexico potentially lead to 
disintegration of, of, of internal cohesion? Like what, what, what's a specific example of, of you feel that happening? I think the effect uh, of, of NAFTA, clearly there were, there were a lot of benefits in, in the ability of uh, firms to, to establish and deepen their value chains and in, in automotive and, and in consumer electronics, uh, those value chains were deepened. Um, you know, if you happen to be working for corporations where this happened and, and you were in the right place in the, in the management or the production chain, you were, you know, clearly benefited. But a lot of communities in the United States were uh, actually fairly devastated by the increase in, in imports from, uh, from Mexico uh, once the tariffs came down um, and, and these production chains um, were established. Now, interestingly, the first order effect of NAFTA is really distributional. I mean, you, if you w- went looking for the overall economic effects, for U.S. national income, GDP, any aggregate measure of well-being in the United States, basically you'd have to go into the second digit after the decimal point to identify any economic effect. But if you look at you know what the effects were on specific communities in the Rust Belt or in in, in some uh, particularly areas that were producing goods that um, were now competing with Mexican imports uh, imports from Mexico directly. Uh, there were some very large effects, and and these effects were not just in tradables in manufacturing, but you know, you know, you would have then uh, these income and job losses translate into reduced demand for uh, local uh, services and uh, businesses, and all kinds of social ills that that went with that. And because the United States is such a does such a terrible job of taking care of, of uh, people who are adversely affected by these shocks. And given that these shocks were very severely localized, when you know you lost a single factory, the whole community and the town was hit very badly. So these had very you know adverse effects. And, and interestingly, it's very much you know a similar story in Mexico as well. I mean, I think many of the northern areas in Mexico did very well. The south, mainly agricultural, did very poorly. Um, so you had this gaps between the gainers and the losers being really the big effect of of NAFTA and not on sort of aggregate economic performance or aggregate employment or aggregate growth. So I want to talk to you about two aspects of the political economy of that. And and the first one is distribution. So when I talk to pro-trade, pro-free trade economists, what you will hear is an argument that goes like this. Free trade and these trade agreements and NAFTA, et cetera, that in both models and I think to some degree in practice, they grow economies and they create a lot more money for everybody. People are able to specialize. The economies get more efficient. You know, everybody wins. But then you'll say, well, but look, there are going to be these communities or these people or these subgroups that lose. And they say, yeah, but but with all the money that is being generated, we can more than compensate the losers. And so that's the argument that is used when you have – abstract discussions about trade. And then we get into the real world where it seems to me there is no actual significant compensation of the losers. And so you have this disconnect between the model, which works as far as I I can tell. I mean, you know, if you were willing to really lean into it, and then the actual politics, which take that first step of creating the trade agreement, but don't really take that second of then saying, Okay, well, we're going to have to make really, really big extra steps to to make sure the distribution of this is working out. And there's something there that the economics profession, to me, has never seriously grappled with. That the failure of the model to account for how the politics actually works, it's not a complicated failure, but it doesn't seem to be one that there's ever been an answer to or an accounting for. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. The proof of the argument that, that you could make trade, particularly trade with low-income countries, work if you had uh, adequate uh, mechanisms of compensation and, and, and redistribution is, is Europe, because Europe has very extensive um, safety nets uh, in the form of an extensive welfare state. And um, trade with countries like China or other low-income countries, you know, to this day actually is not politically controversial in Europe in large part because they have a very good system of of taking care of the losers. So that we can see how their their existing 
safety nets have insulated a lot of the losers. Now, in the United States, I think the mistake that was made here was that with every trade agreement that was signed, and, and NAFTA was not an exception, there was a tendency for trying to bring the potential losers and, and labor unions along by promising with each new agreement uh, an expansion of what's called trade adjustment assistance, so that you promise compensation. But then, you know, the, the compensation, it turns out, is never provided after the fact for the very reason you've identified, which is that, you know, once you've signed the trade agreement, the, the political incentive after the fact to make the funding available to ensure that it works as advertised is simply not there. In fact, you know, this is a problem that economists call the problem of time inconsistency or dynamic inconsistency, you know. You have an incentive to promise compensate, but once you've achieved the, des- the policy change that you wanted, you actually don't have an incentive to follow through on it because you can't simply reverse the agreement, uh, at least not you know without cost. So this was perfectly predictable, and I think it's it's a it's a consequence of the fact that you know the welfare state and and, and safety nets in the United States have always been weak, and the only time that really works is promise of compensation is when compensation or redistribution is an ingrained part of the, you know, an explicit bargain, a constitutive part of the social contract, if you will, and it's not directed uh, solely at trade, but it's part of, you know, essentially a, a social contract that is much broader in the form of a, a strong welfare state, and that's what we have um, in, in the case of Europe. It's always struck me that when you try to think about what would a really robust trade adjustment assistance program look like, you know, if we if we were really going to fall through on that promise, how would you do it? It gets very, very difficult. The losers of trade deals, if you are in a community where the manufacturing jobs collapsed, okay, maybe it's pretty easy to trace who got fired from the plant. I mean, we we could do that if we chose and give them significant compensation, again, if we chose. Sometimes we give them a little bit, but but never certainly more than enough to to make up for what happened. But what about the um, waitress who worked at the coffee shop right near it? What about the mother whose husband is now home and moping and upset? And you kind of go down the line. And one of the things that has always struck me about American policy in general is we're very bad at place-based policy. We do not have good programs that really focus on specific communities. We have a couple things to try, things like you know, tax credits for this or that community. But in general, we don't like saying Detroit is suffering. We're going to help Detroit. We're really going to make a specific effort to help Detroit in part because it feels unfair. You know, why, if you're helping Detroit, you know, shouldn't you also help Stockton, California or whatever it might be? But I I always think that even within the theory of this, that people underestimate how hard it would be to manage the specific to, to really do something that isn't just redistributing money to, quote unquote, the poor or the working class, but to, to, to try to make sure these specific losers of trade were compensated. You know, I, I've written recently that, I mean, we've been talking about compensation and, and redistribution, but let, let's be clear that for a whole bunch of reasons, including those that you've just um, mentioned, you know, having this conversation in a future-oriented uh, way that you know, the time for compensation or redistribution has come and gone. Uh, you know, this is really a discussion about what we might have done and did not do. And there are you know, all kinds of reasons about why compensation is not going to work in, for the future. And it has to do with the fact that you know, if you just do the math, the amount of resources that you need to raise to really do a proper compensation would, you know, exhaust the gains from trade that you're getting with these new agreements, given the, the form that they take. You have all kinds of other issues about which you're getting at, which is why would you want to compensate some type of losers and not others? What's what's special about trade and so forth? So, and I think you're right about the peculiarities of the U.S. system, which is. The U.S. attachment to a certain version of localism means that in, in, in some ways there is too little fiscal centralization in the U.S. That, you know, once property values, for example, in a particular community start going down, the whole resource base collapses with that. So your ability to do something with public resources also goes down and so forth, given the dependence on, uh, on local property taxes. But let me just make two points with respect to 
redistribution or compensation, which aren't sufficiently appreciated. One is that, just like in the case of the European welfare state, for much of the, you know, for many trade shocks, it's not at all clear why you would want to just pick on trade. If somebody's losing their job, you know, it shouldn't matter whether that person, as you said, is, is a waitress or is, you know, a production worker in some steel factory. For the bulk of trade, it's no different than other kinds of economic shocks. So we should have safety nets or uh, that, that are, you know, whether place-based or, you know, more uh, generically designed that, that take care better of, of, of people. The second issue is that some types of trade shocks are not properly handled simply by telling people, oh, never mind, we're just going to give you a handout. Because when we force American workers to compete with workers in other countries where workers' rights are grossly violated, where you know, basic you know, health and safety requirements and factories are not in place, we are doing something that's very different from when a worker loses their job because you know, somebody has come up with a better product or somebody turns out to be a better competitor. We're basically telling that worker that you know, we expect you to compete with workers under competition rules that we find unconscionable you know, domestically, but yet this is what you have to do. And, and I think that is a fundamentally different kind of uh, competition. And I think we should have different ways of dealing with such types of competition. I've, I, I've talked uh, in my own writings about making an allowance for cases of, of, of social dumping, uh, which is basically cases where we're forcing our, our workers to compete um, uh, under conditions that would be completely illegal or unconscionable from a moral or ethical standpoint uh, domestically. And I think in those cases, actually, it's, it's perfectly appropriate to think about uh, how we protect our workers differently than simply giving them a handout. Um, and in some such cases, it's as 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 plausible to protect them through uh, trade remedies, such as blocking off that trade or putting some import tariffs, in quite the same way that that we have anti-dumping duties when foreign firms are trying to undercut uh, domestic firms because they're being subsidized or they're pricing below marginal costs for um, for predation reasons. You know, we can block that kind of trade because we say it's not fair trade. You know, we have to really think about, you know, how that same concept of fairness also applies uh, with respect to trade that might be having adverse environmental, consumer safety, or, or I think what I'm really most concerned with is, is sort of labor standard, you know, considerations at home. Donald Trump has just put $50 billion worth of tariffs on China, uh, pointing out, I, th I think correctly, that they've been stealing our intellectual property and engaging in unfair business practices relative to us for the better part of 30 or 40 years, um, 30 years, certainly. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the truth of it is that this is mainly political theater, uh, as yeah. most of what Mr. Trump has been doing seems to me to be. That is, it's posturing... Uh, playing to the audience that uh, wants him to be tough or uh, look out for America first. Uh, and let me explain why I think that's what's going on. First, uh, it is an old truism of economics learned over hundreds of years that less developed countries borrow from those ahead of them in order to catch up. It's what the United States did early in our history in relationship to Britain and Europe and what many other countries have done as well. The Chinese are doing it too. That's why they have been uh, taking uh, intellectual property, if you like, because that's the most valuable economic development of our time. 
Mm -hmm. If history teaches us anything, it teaches us that the attempt to prevent it, to stop it, to block it does not work. Either it does not solve the problem or it produces such horrific consequences, trade wars, military wars, and so on, that it's not worth the effort, uh, which doesn't work anyway, to stop it. Right. But let me explain why it doesn't work. First, the ways of evading tariffs are many and easy. To give you an example with the tariffs he's already put down on steel and aluminum. China is a tiny player in sending those goods to the United States. That's about 2% of, our, of their exports are U.S. That's right. Yeah. 2 or 3% of, of what we bring in comes from China. And the easy thing for the Chinese to do, which is they have already been doing, is basically to sell their uh, steel and aluminum to other countries for to reship it or to slightly process it. And then this stuff comes uh, into the United States from Mexico or Canada, which got the original steel from China, etc., etc. Number two, the Chinese will retaliate. And indeed, the joke here is that's partly to pander uh, to their audience on the part of the Chinese leadership, which has to show it won't be pushed around. And so they will, for example, stop importing soybeans and sorghum and all kinds of crops, uh, which is what the Chinese are hinting, which will hurt the very farmers that voted for Mr. Trump. Yeah, particularly in Iowa. <laughs> right. Which is like you'll, soybean central. Right. And you'll see then an enormous flurry of public relations aiming to somehow blame the Chinese or who knows who else uh, foreigners are preferred, because when you do this kind of theater, uh, it's always good to blame the foreigner. It seems to play well. The Chinese do it. The Russians do it. We're doing it. But the end result is all kinds of economic damage to placate the political ambitions uh, of Mr. Trump and his entourage. At some point, the various economic interests that are hurt by all of this will coalesce, figure out how to work together and make life exceedingly difficult for Mr. Trump. He may be calculating that the popularity of tough guy outweighs that risk. But in the history that we look at, it's never worked out quite that well. Uh, it's either led to war with the unspeakable suffering that would imply or the end of the kind of regime that Trump has as too many hurt people coalesce and get rid of it. I, I went off on a rant in the in the previous hour uh, based on a, a piece by uh, Eve Smith uh, titled Economists Shocked that China Invalidates Their Pet View That Economic Liberalization Produces Political Liberalization. Uh, remembering the debates of 1992 between George Bush and George the, Bush the Elder and Bill Clinton uh, and, and Ross Perot, in which both Bush and Clinton were arguing that if, uh, and, and this is the basis of the post-World War II order, frankly, um, if countries only did more trade with each other, they'd be far less likely to go to war with each other. And uh, Eve Smith is, is writing over at, uh, at uh, naked, uh, nakedcapitalism.com that, you know, we should have seen it with World War I that this was nonsense. I mean, you know, this, uh, what are your thoughts on this, the, the, the selling of neoliberalism as a way to prevent war? Well, you know, I think they were trying to sell neoliberalism with any argument that would come to mind. Um, and I understand, given its performance, why they had to do that. But the truth of the matter is, yes, that World War I is the perfect counterexample. The war was a the most destructive, I believe, in human history so far. And it was carried on by people who had been trading with each other in a rising crescendo for the previous half century. So, yeah, it's clear to me that uh, big trade partners become dependent on each other. And like participants in a cartel, uh, 
yeah, we work together until one of us thinks we can pull a fast one on the others and imagines that they can do that without retaliation and then makes a fatal miscalculation and then the war starts. And it seems to me that the Chinese-American codependency, which it clearly is, is fraught with the risk that either side will decide it can, for its own reasons, break the understanding and the codependency. In this case, it's clearly the Trump administration, it's the United States, not the Chinese that are doing it. And if we have a trade war, as the whole world now knows, it will have been clearly initiated by Mr. Trump, and therefore the resulting catastrophe, economic and perhaps also political and militarily, it will be really clear where the world points the finger for doing this. While we may be failing to decrease poverty, aren't we at least doing a better job than we ever have in human history? Are we doing a a failing but better job on poverty just like we are doing a failing and better job on racism and sexism? Because those are arguments we always hear from those who are too often apologists for ongoing racism and sexism. And I'm wondering if those same people could make similar statements about poverty and the unfairness of our global economic system. So the narrative about poverty is really an interesting one, and, and so too about inequality. We can get to that a little bit later. But the, the, the dominant narrative here is that um, the Millennium Development Goals under the UN over the past 15 or, or 17, 18 years has been incredibly successful at reducing poverty around the world. And we're told now that with sustainable development goals, uh, we'll eradicate poverty, hopefully, by 2030. Um, and this is a very compelling story. It's, it's a, a wonderful bit of good news in a world full of bad news. It gives us hope and makes us feel like we're on the right track. But unfortunately, it's a story that's, um, that's been used basically to justify the status quo of the global economy. So the idea is that, um, uh, sure, you know, inequality might be getting worse in nations like the U.S., et cetera, but, uh, but basically the system of neoliberal uh, corporate globalization is delivering gains against poverty in poor nations. And so it should be celebrated and we should, we should keep on with the, uh, with the existing plan. Um, now, that might be a worthwhile argument um, if it weren't for the fact that it's based on pretty shoddy data. Now, the thing here is that is that the uh, the narrative of poverty being reduced relies on a poverty line of only a of only a dollar twenty five a day. Okay, this is the standard international poverty line, um, and according to this, they're saying that poverty is uh, is diminishing around the world, down to about one billion people. Now, what's interesting here is that the vast majority of those gains, virtually all of those gains, in fact, have come from one place, and that's from China. Okay, so and the reason that's important is because China has basically not followed the the uh, the strategy of neoliberal globalization that the rest of the world um, has been forced to follow under uh, pressure from the U.S., the World Bank, and the IMF, and so on. So it's it doesn't really make sense to include China's gains against poverty in this broader story of you know uh, U.S.-led uh, um, free market economies are, are are winning the game for everybody. So um, if you take China out of the equation, then we see that there's been virtually no gain um, against poverty uh, since at least the 1980s. We have roughly the same number of people in extreme poverty today as we did back then. Uh, so that's, that's quite disturbing. But the bigger issue here also is that uh, the $1.25 a day line that, uh, that the UN uses and the World Bank uses is not considered to be accurate by scholars of poverty. So if you look at the consensus among academics, uh, the poverty line should actually be closer to about five dollars per day as a minimum necessary for uh, people to achieve basic normal human life expectancy, um, reasonable standards of uh, of nutrition, uh, of uh, maternal mortality, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens if we measure um, poverty at the five dollar a day line? What we see is that it has been increasing dramatically since the 1980s and is today at about four point three billion people, which is sixty percent of the human population. And with, with these kinds of numbers on the table, then it's very clear that not only is the situation not getting better, uh, but also it's evidence that the global economic system is simply not serving the majority of humanity 
And so what we need here is to think beyond just tweaking the system a little bit with some aid here and there and think about how to, how to fundamentally restructure it so that it delivers a fair share of our world's resources to the people that need it most. Can we just do globally whatever it is China is doing to end poverty and inequality? So yeah, China's an interesting, um, interesting example here. So they've, they've basically exercised state control over, um, over uh, a lot of their market policy. Now, they have, of course, integrated into the world economy, but they've done so on their own terms. Okay, so um, now this was something that was denied to the majority of the world's uh, um, poorer nations during the 1980s and 1990s. What happened basically, and you can talk about this more at length if you like, but what happened basically is that um, uh, after the third world debt crisis of 1980, then the IMF um, imposed what we call structural adjustment programs across global South nations. And what they did was they reversed um, policies of protectionism and nationalization and social spending um, in favor of uh, you know, getting rid of tariffs, privatizing public assets, cutting social spending and using that as debt repayment, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, getting rid of capital controls, uh, allowing multinational corporations more freedom to, uh, to operate in these nations, and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and what that, what that did effectively was it dramatically cut the ability of these poor nations to grow their own per capita incomes okay, and reduce poverty on their own terms. And so during the 1980s and 1990s, under these structural adjustment programs, uh, it was a complete disaster in terms of development for the global South. Uh, and and today they're only just beginning to catch up to their 1980s levels, basically. Um, so unfortunately, those are lost decades to us now. Um, I mean, ideally, uh, nations would have been able to follow the China model during those decades, but they were uh, debarred from doing so because, effectively, because it was against uh, the the U.S.'s interest to allow them to do so, as it would have denied the U.S. access to uh, to their markets and to cheap raw materials from those nations. So, did we create a system through the IMF structural adjustment program to make developing nations permanently indebted to us? So, the way it worked was that the uh, the debts actually began to accumulate in the 1970s before structural adjustment. So, um, uh, effectively, what you had here was you had a surplus of capital being accumulated in the U.S. Uh, and banks were looking for ways to invest that surplus capital. Uh, but they couldn't find any place to invest it in the U.S., basically, because the U.S. was going through a period of stagnation in the 70s. So what they did instead is they invested all of their excess capital um, abroad in the form of loans to developing countries, uh, uh, developing country governments. Um, and, of course, they were glad to take those loans. But then what happened in, in 1980 was that Paul Volcker, the chair of the Federal Reserve, increased interest rates uh, in the U.S. Uh, pretty dramatically up to about 20%. And because these Global South loans were denominated in U.S. dollars, um, uh, debt levels rose dramatically in Global South nations, and they were unable to pay the debt. Now, normally they would, you know, they chose to default on the debt, which should be their right under any free market system. Um, but the U.S. refused to allow them to default on the debts because that would have basically toppled Wall Street banks, which were massively overexposed to these toxic debts. So the IMF was used by the U.S. to step in and solve the debt crisis by forcing Global South nations to repay uh, these, uh, these unpayable debts by, again, privatizing their public assets, cutting social spending, literally taking money out of the mouths of, of poor people, out of the, the pockets of, of workers, um, and sending it to um, over-indebted banks in the U.S. Um, so so it was really less a way of creating a debt crisis as a, a sort of uh, a way of solving a debt crisis um, uh, that was discriminatory against uh, the majority of the world's poor people in favor of U.S. banks. That's kind of how it worked. And, and, and of course, this, was, you know, this worked out to be incredibly in the interest of, uh, of the U.S. because um, it allowed them to you know, regain access to global south markets, um, uh, to use their cheap labor and raw materials, and so on. So for them, it was a huge benefit. But, uh, but it, it created massive amounts of new poverty in the, in the global south in the 80s and 90s. You write that viewing uh, global inequality as a technical problem that can be fixed by international institutions like the IMF maintains an industry worth billions of dollars and an army of NGOs, charities, and foundations seeking to uh, end poverty through aid and charity. It has become an enormous industry worth hundreds of billions of dollars, as much as all the profits of all the banks in the United States combined. Will there be global inequality, even growing global inequality and global poverty, as long as there's money to be made in pushing the idea that technical fixes can end global poverty? Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's interesting. So, um, so the way the development industry works right now is they kind of assume that we can solve these problems by just tweaking, uh, you know, a few policies here and there in the way the global economy works. 
but they're mostly focused on on uh, policy problems in poor nations. Okay, so the idea is that poor nations are primarily responsible for their own failures here, and so we need to go in there and sort of fix their corruption. Uh, get them to adopt the right policies, and we can do this with a little bit of aid here and there, right? Now, the problem here is that it, is that this approach completely ignores the way that the global economy actually works. So, um, you know, if we look at the aid disbursements that rich nations give to poor nations every year, again, about $130 billion each year, which is an enormous amount of money. Um, in reality, this flow of aid is actually vastly outstripped by money that flows in the opposite direction um, in the form of illicit financial flows, uh, tax evasion by, by multinational companies, um, effectively taking profits out of developing countries where they operate and stashing them in tax havens, uh, mostly controlled by Western countries like the UK and the US. Um, you know, uh, uh, interest payments on debts are a huge part of this as well, repatriated profits, um, and so on and so forth. So we know that, um, according to recent research, which is very illuminating on this, uh, more money flows from poor nations to rich nations every year than the other way around. So the, the global South, is a net creditor to the global north, which is uh, really kind of a mind-blowing fact that reverses the way that we think about uh, how the development industry actually works. Um, so for every dollar of aid that the South receives, they actually lose $24 in net outflows. Um, so what we need to do is we need to stop thinking of aid as a solution. Um, I mean, effectively, aid, you know, what it does is it makes the takers in the system, which are rich countries, uh, appear like givers and gives them a kind of moral high ground. And this obscures from us the way the global economic system actually works and prevents us from recognizing what we can actually do to, to solve the problem of, glo of global inequality. So we need to take a more structural view, think about how the system is designed, whose interest it serves, who has power in the system and who doesn't. Uh, and, and, and those are the kinds of, of interventions we need to make. Has development either become or was it originally intended to be just another form of colonial or imperial power? You mentioned how uh, the whole idea mm -hmm. of the development started in the 1949 inaugural speech by President Harry Truman. That's right after the war ends, right after colonialism seemingly mm -hmm. is uh, collapsing around the world. So how much uh, was development originally intended to or was it turned into just another form of colonial or imperial power? Yeah, so this is an important story, I think, and one that to me is quite important in, in, in the divide. Um, so it's crucial to understand that, that uh, okay, so of course, colonialism was an economic disaster for, for the global south, okay? Um, but then after colonialism, after European powers withdrew from the shores of the global, of the global south colonies, and after, um, you know, the U.S. adopted under Franklin, uh, under Franklin Roosevelt the, uh, the good neighbor policy, which, which effectively withdrew their um, their control from Latin America. So in the wake of this withdrawal, then, um, then uh, newly independent Global South nations began using progressive economic policies, uh, mostly Keynesian, basically, economic policies, uh, to, um, to kind of rebuild their economies. And they did so with remarkable success. Okay? So again, making excellent use of tariffs and infant industry subsidies and social spending and nationalization um, and uh, land reform, wage reform, et cetera, et cetera. They were, and they were doing really well. They were um, making strides against poverty, and for the first time in history, they were closing the gaps between rich nations and poor nations. Now, you would think that the West would be excited about this, because the West, you know, of course, claims to be pro-development. Uh, but in fact, they were deeply disturbed, because what this, what, what this pattern basically meant is that they were losing their access to global South markets and to cheap raw materials and cheap labor, which they had previously enjoyed under colonialism. Okay? So they had to find some way of restoring that access and the way they did it initially was to was was violently, okay. And this is a history that most people have forgotten. Uh, but the U.S. Um, and the U.K. and uh, and France and a few other um, former European colonial powers were heavily invested in trying to topple uh, progressive uh, political regimes across the global south, which they did through the 50s and 60s and 70s in at least a dozen or more cases. Probably the most famous of these is the uh, the assassination of Salvador Allende the progressive, uh, uh, democratically elected um, uh, president of uh, Chile in 1973. Um, but it began under Eisenhower in 1953 with the coup against uh, um, Iran's democratically elected leader. Uh, because Iran had um, nationalized uh, their oil reserves, which uh, had previously been controlled by BP, by Britain, um, you know, uh, this is why Britain reacted against Iran. They called in the U.S. for support. The same pattern was played out over and over and over again, where progressive regimes um, fundamentally acted against the economic interests of former colonial powers or the U.S. 
and were either deposed or assassinated uh, for their uh, for their policies. Um, and quite often, in 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 in, in their place, uh, were installed dictatorships that you know promised effectively to re-liberalize the economy, to re-allow Western corporations back in. Uh, to effectively do what they wanted to. So this is kind of the pattern that played out through the 60s and 70s. But it, but it really wasn't until the 1980s that, um, w- you know, with the imposition of structural adjustment, in one fell swoop, they were able to, the U.S. and uh, Western Europe were able to reverse all of the progressive economic policies that the Global South had um, so painstakingly enacted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, yeah, there's no question that, and, and crucially, right, uh, structural adjustment and subsequent policies in the South um, have been have been brought in under the banner of development, despite the fact that the opposite has actually occurred. Um, and so it's very clear that with these with these kinds of interventions, the idea behind development, you know, at least as led by the World Bank and IMF, has crucially been uh, designed in order to restore uh, economic hegemony to uh, to Western economies, and has been very successful at doing that. We've just heard clips today, starting with Professor Richard Wolf on Economic Update, explaining the economics and politics of tariffs. Left Out spoke with Michael Hudson about just a few of the major aspects of trade that Trump seems to not understand. The Inquiry explained some of the historical context of trading with China and the possibility that the international order may have to bend to incorporate China's perspective. The Ezra Klein Show talked with Danny Roderick about why the domestic solution to trading with poorer countries countries isn't trade protectionism, but the protections offered by strong social safety nets. Tom Hartman spoke with Richard Wolff about the very real dangers of trade wars and the myth that countries that trade together don't go to war together. And finally, we just heard This Is Hell speaking with Jason Hickel about the history of power imbalances and the long shadow of colonialism that has brought our state of international trade to where it is today. As always, you can find links to each of these segments in the show notes for easy reference and sharing. And now we'll hear from you. But first, a quick refresher that a few weeks ago, regular caller V from New York called in questioning whether progressivism has a solid enough historical, philosophical foundation. And unsurprisingly, we're still hearing responses about it. Hi, Jay. It's Dave out of Olympia, Washington. Listening to the most recent voicemail that I have heard from B around the idea of the philosophy of progressivism, it's not clear and it's hard to interpret sometimes what people mean out of what they say, but it almost sounds as if he's looking for a dogma, not a philosophy, a pat answer, which is the answer regardless of the circumstances, um, which is not a philosophy. A philosophy is flexible and can adapt to circumstances. It's, It's general guidance where, you know, a dogma is, you know, always smaller government. This is always the answer, regardless of what your problem is. I guarantee you the answer is smaller government. That's not really philosophy. That's a dogma. But I'm not sure. So I'm posing the question. Is that what uh, you're looking for, V, when when you say that there should be a philosophy? You're looking for a a simple true line, a slogan for, for all circumstances? Or is the kind of discussion around what this would mean, you know, philosophically, best utility, maximize value, is that, which I see as much more philosophical language, is that kind of answering your underlying question? So there you go. Jay, stay awesome. Jay, it's Dave from Olympia. I'm just responding, or I guess tangenting off the, the comment and discussion about how to, you know, fight the excesses of capitalism while still living within capitalism, specifically ad support for the show. And this reminded me of something I heard during the heyday of Occupy as an occupation, where you know, complaints were being made about these, you know, these darn hippies that uh, 
dare use cell phones to communicate? Don't they know that, that corporations provide them cell phones? And I wish I could give credit where credit is due. I forget where I heard this, but it's not original to me. But the idea of, you know, <laughs> it's like criticizing uh, lifeguards for jumping into the pool, you know, to try and save people from from drowning. Don't they know that, you know, wearing a swimsuit and getting in the pool is what got these people into trouble in the first place? If you're going to, you know, how dare you try and save people from drowning? If, you know, if you're if you're that opposed to drowning, why are you even putting on a swimsuit and why are you sitting on a lifeguard chair? You should just get out of the business entirely, which isn't 100 percent. But I thought it was uh, it amused me at the time. Thought I'd share it. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. And thanks, of course, to Dave for his comments. I always love hearing from Dave, and I can always depend on him for being so prolific that uh, that I usually have at least a handful of Dave voicemails that I, I can play anytime there's a slowdown in, in the messages from everyone else. So so drowning in capitalism, I, I appreciate the metaphor. I, I think I agree with Dave. It's not the best metaphor I've ever heard, but it is entertaining, and I certainly take its point. If you didn't hear or if you don't recall, he's responding to a listener who called in, uh, made very nice comments about the show, said that you know she was listening to an episode that was sort of criticizing some of the negative aspects of capitalism, and then a commercial came on. As inevitably happens with a show like mine, trying to exist within capitalism and criticize it at the same time, it's a conundrum that that people like me or, or people in my position are very familiar with. So, so I played the listener's voicemail and responded to it, just trying to give my perspective on how I try to walk that line. And the update is something that, as is usually the case, I have no way of knowing if it is connected or not. But the advertiser in question that just happened to be mentioned, I mean, the the conversation was not about the advertiser by any stretch. It was really just a conversation about advertising in general. And and so the listener mentioned a specific advertiser. We had a conversation about it. And that advertiser has now canceled all of their future ad buys for the rest of the year. And they didn't send a message. They didn't explain you know, I broke some sort of rule or talked about them or disparaged them, which I clearly didn't. And to be clear, this happens all the time. Companies place ad buys or they sort of suggest that they're going to buy ads for months and months in advance, and then sometimes they get canceled. So it's possible it's an absolute coincidence. They didn't send a note. I have no way of knowing. But it certainly makes you say, hmm. So really what this is, is just another good reminder for why it is so important to fund independent media like this directly. This is the conclusion we came to before, and it's it's just a frustrating state of affairs that a very, very small percentage of people pony up a few bucks a month to support shows like this. And, and I understand, I mean, maybe you listen to dozens of shows and you'd like to support all of them, but obviously can't afford five bucks a piece times dozens of shows, I get it. That being said, shows like this only get, you know, definitely less than 5% is normal. 1% is definitely normal and and about average, I would say. So that's the case with me. I'm somewhere in the like one, one to 2% range of people are, are donating on a regular basis to support this show. So if this is a, a good reminder and a good uh, excuse to take action on, on that and and you've been meaning to support the show, you've been meaning to uh, become a patron on Patreon, uh, you've been meaning to sign up for whatever reason, if this is a good reason to do it, God bless, go ahead. One more thing to mention, though, as you may or may not have noticed, especially if you're a longtime listener, uh, for the last year or so, I, I've been doing three shows on, one show off uh, with a regular rerun schedule. 
I'm speaking to you now from our fifth consecutive episode without a rerun, and I wasn't planning on making a big announcement or anything like that, but uh, I just want to point out that we are working extremely hard and experimenting with brand new ways of working. We have changed major paradigms of uh, of the work that goes into this show and how it gets done to try to streamline every single aspect of the show that we can to make it sustainable to do the show with the old schedule of two brand new shows every week, no reruns, uh, except for extenuating circumstances that inevitably come up where we have to take time off or holidays or whatever. But the goal is to get back to a regular two new episodes every week, no exceptions schedule. And if you want to see that happen, as you can see evidenced by the last five episodes, we are trying to make it happen. Uh, We're still in the experimentation phase, trying to see if this uh, new way of working, this new schedule is sustainable. But if you want to make that happen and help make it sustainable, that is another reason to sign up now. So to donate any amount each month, go to patreon.com slash best of the left. Uh, memberships start at six bucks a month. That's where you get all the bonus material and everything. But if you only want to chip in a dollar or two, that helps as well. And, and finally, I just want to mention that if you are an existing member or you think you're an existing member or you vaguely recall that at some point you were an existing member, but you aren't hearing bonus content in the podcast feed that you use to listen to the show, check in on that. First of all, if you are a member, I want you to be hearing every bit of bonus content that you deserve to be hearing as a member. Otherwise, if you think you're a member, but your payment expired a long time ago, or something happened and it turns out you aren't, now would be a good time to renew and get back on track. So all of the details that you need Uh, If you've been a member or were a member a long time ago, but you're not getting the bonus content, all of the information you need is at bestoftheleft.com slash switch. We just went through a big uh, changeover process for existing members, getting them signed up on Patreon. So the easy way to know if you are signed up properly as a member is if you are signed up on Patreon. If you are not signed up on Patreon, you are not going to be getting all of the bonus content. Or anything like that. So all of the details about getting switched over and signed up properly, again, can be found at bestoftheleft.com slash switch. That is going to do it for today. Keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991. Thanks, of course, to everyone, not just for listening, but to supporting the show however you do. If you have become a member or you're making donations of any size at patreon.com slash bestoftheleft, that is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog, and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestoftheleft.com. Best of the Left.